This is our 25th anniversary, or as Howard likes to say, we're 25 years young, uh, founded by the Lauder family, that is Estee Lauder and her two sons, Leonard and Ronald. We are about three things, diagnostics, prevention, and treatments. And we're gonna hear all about prevention today, which I know is a favorite subject. I always chuckle a little bit too, because you know we're about two thirds filled, and by the time 11.30 rolls around, we'll be 100% filled. This is a hot topic today. Um, the other piece I will say about ADDF, uh, just as a reminder, and, and maybe those of you don't know, we don't make grants to academic institutions or to biotechs, we make investments. So we have a contract with anybody we give money to, if they see any kind of positive movement moving from the bench to the bedside with their diagnostics, treatments, or preventions, we get a piece of that and we immediately put that money back into more science. That is the philanthropy part of venture philanthropy. So that's us. Um, any of you who were here last year, it was just brilliant. We had two phenomenal honorees, and actually both are in the room today. First, I'll ask you if you remember, we, we uh, honored the Eli Lilly Corporation, who sponsor this scientific symposium today. And uh, if you want hot breaking news, just last week, Eli Lilly announced results from their anti, top line results from their anti-amyloid drug trial. And the headline on that is very, very, very promising. So Eli Lilly sponsoring us today and a partner for a long, long time. Thank you, you're fabulous. The other honoree is our next speaker. She is an Emmy award-winning journalist, NBC, MSNBC, um, we are thrilled she's here with, her, with us today because we got all of a sudden yesterday got to be a really busy news day which spilled into today. Uh, I don't know if any of you noticed. Uh, she is a fixture uh, on MSNBC. She is a fixture in the uh, DC political uh, circles and media circles and social circles, but much more than that. She is a huge friend and advocate and supporter of the ADDF and a very, very close friend with the Lauder family. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the one, the only, Ms. Andrea Mitchell. So, thank you so much. It's great to see some wonderful friends here in the audience and Mark and all of our friends with ADDF. Uh, this is just a unique organization. Uh, the, what the Lauders have created here is the only uh, philanthropy that is completely family funded uh, and the, the investments in promising uh, research are just profoundly important. Uh, it's wonderful what E.I. Lilly has accomplished and Dr. Phillett is gonna be talking more about that. I was reading about it and excited uh, about the fact that he's gonna be here. As I understand from Mark, you were all at the Milken Forum in LA and Dr. Phillip was a featured interview um, by Milken about just how exciting this is. I mean, this is the leading edge. And all of what we've been hearing for these many years uh, that we've been here in this event about the amyloids and what kind of research could be possible is all coming to fruition, and it's coming to fruition in our lifetime. So um, you're all part of that, and your support here today uh, means so much to all of us. Uh, so on, on behalf of the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation, it's, it's really my pleasure to be here. Um, as Mark referenced, this has been a really busy time. As I was leaving the studio this morning to come here, my executive producer was saying, are you really, really sure about the lead of our show at noon? We were you know, writing it and producing it and choosing the tapes. And we were in early this morning to go through a, a lot of things knowing that I was coming here. And this is usually our crunch time of writing and producing the, the final parts of the show. And our studio is now 20 minutes from here on Capitol Hill. It used to be much closer when we started this 13 years ago. Uh, so I used to have a little more flexibility. I'm not going to be able to stay quite as long as I'd like to, but I'll get a full fill in from you all later, I hope, because what Elise and Mark Lefkowitz have done in creating this event is just extraordinary. And we want to thank Elise and Mark 
for their devotion to this. Um, in creating this in support of ADDF, it's really the only charity so focused on accelerating the development of drugs for a devastating disease. I don't know anyone in this room who has not in some way been affected, a family, you know, a parent, you know, some other relative uh, or a friend affected by this terrible disease. Uh, as Dr. Phillip likes to say, we've entered an exciting new era, and that's an understatement. Uh, he's being his cautious scientific self, but this really is an exciting new era of research. New breakthroughs emerging uh, with drug approvals already happening, even more drugs focused on novel targets advancing through clinical trials, including many funded through the ADDF portfolio. The biology of aging approach, supported by ADDF, is helping bring to market a diverse array of drugs that can be used in combination to stop Alzheimer's in its tracks. We're seeing, as we've said, serious progress. And that's thanks in large part to the incredible research funds provided by ADDF, gathering together some of the best and brightest minds in the world, leading me naturally to our panelists today. Our symposium, of course, is led by Dr. Howard Fillett, acknowledged, you know, well, the co-founder and chief science officer, but now acknowledged worldwide as the leading research scientist in the field. Uh, a geriatri geriatrician, a neuroscientist, he's been involved in Alzheimer's research for 40 years. You look too young to have been doing this for 40 years, Dr. <laughs> Phillip, but yeah. Which reminds me, I've been at NBC for 44 years. Can you think of that? Wow. <laughs> insane. Uh, I know it's hard to imagine I started. I was so young when I started. <laughs> and as we talk about aging, we'll be joined by Dr. Christine Yaffe of the University of California at San Francisco and Dr. Jose Luxinger of Columbia University. Um, they are going to talk about all the innovative research we're seeing on different aspects of Alzheimer's, of prevention, which is important, I know, to everyone here, and to slowing the progress of this disease. And you're going to have the opportunity to ask questions of these renowned scientists and to get these answered directly, you know, right from the forefront of research. So that is the wonderful opportunity. And then for dessert, you, of course, have a wonderful lunch, all of your friends, and the great Acris fashions. I am, for one, devoted to Acris myself, so I, um, I'm a loyal Acris supporter. <laughs> so, without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce our friend, the chief scientist, the co-founder um, of ADDF, Dr. Howard Phillip and his colleagues. Uh, I, I want to welcome all of you. Thank you for coming. We really appreciate your support and being working with us here. Uh, I hope we have a great day. We're really focused on prevention today. Um, I, I would say that it's amazing that we can really even talk intelligently about prevention from the perspective that when I started in the field 40 years ago, we knew almost nothing about Alzheimer's disease. And over the 40 years, um, these two scientists and doctors have made a great contribution to our understanding about how to prevent this disease. And so if somebody asks you, I hope whether or not we can actually prevent Alzheimer's, I think you'll find very interesting information that today it is possible. Um, as Andrea mentioned, um, we've been at this um, at, at the foundation for about 25 years. Um, and we've seen finally, after all these years of research, uh, breakthroughs, as was mentioned. I mean, we have two drugs on the market now through accelerated approval. We're going to have a third, I believe, over the summer coming to a full approval application with the FDA. And some really interesting results from Lilly and Biogen and Esai. Um, and actually, I found out last week that I could even start prescribing one of these uh, monoclonal antibodies to slow down the disease uh, in Manhattan in my little practice. The, these kinds of results are the, are the result of 40 years of research in the field. Um, from a time when I remember that we knew basically nothing about the disease to where we are today. And some of the breakthroughs that enabled us getting to, to where we are today were actually um, either by serendipity or intelligence uh, developed by the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation. One of the first things we did 
was um, actually to start developing the PET scan, the PET amyloid scan at the University of Pennsylvania back in the year 1999. And it, the basis of the current approvals of the drugs for, for um, removing the amyloid from the brain are really very much based on that test that we developed. And it was the reason why we developed that test or funded development of that test was to accelerate drug development. So you know, we, we went all the way from very earliest stages of developing the test all the way through its use, not only in, um, in drug development as, as we've seen today, but also in clinical practice. It's amazing the change in clinical practice that's occurring right now. Um, if I see a patient with memory problems and I'm not really sure what they have or they're thinking about going into a clinical trial where a positive PET scan would be required, I can send them down to the radiology office down the block from my office, and within 24 hours I can tell them with about 90, 95 percent certainty if they have Alzheimer's disease. That's a big breakthrough. Not only that, but with companies like C2N that we've invested in out of the Uni Washington University in St. Louis, there's a blood test on the market now. It's available in 49 states. Uh, New York is the last hanger on, because um, they have the most strict uh, regulatory for these blood tests. But it will come to New York. And I can already order a blood test. And the blood test correlates with the brain scan. So this markedly reduces the cost of clinical trials. It markedly reduces the cost to patients. And it's convenient. Um, it's part of the normal workflow of a doctor's office to order a blood test. And there are better blood tests that are coming down of the pike that are going to be even better than the ones that are on the market now. Um, and these tests are going to become increasingly complex and, and novel because, as, as Andrea mentioned, we finally have this first generation. It's such a huge breakthrough in the history of the world, the first generation of treatments for Alzheimer's disease, monoclonal antibodies to amyloid. But they're based on this framework that aging is the leading risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. We are funding several. Uh, approaches to uh, translating the knowledge about aging into new drugs for Alzheimer's disease. <clears throat> so just as evidence of that, about five years ago, 75% of the drugs that were being developed for Alzheimer's disease were, mono were antibodies against the amyloid protein, which is the pathology of the disease, and the tangles, which is also part of the pathology. Today, 75% of the drugs in development are non-amyloid, non-tau, novel approaches like inflammation in the brain of Alzheimer's patients, which is a hallmark of aging and a hallmark of Alzheimer's disease now recognized that way, and seven or eight other pathways that I won't talk about. I don't want to take up too much time here. But I will say that um, you know people say, well, you've been at this 40 years. <laughs> Aren't you discouraged? No, I've never been more excited about what we're doing than, than I am today, and I think we all share that. It's really amazing what's, what's come about just in the last few years. So with that, I want to turn it over to a subject that I know is really near and dear to all our hearts. And we really have, we really and truly have uh, two of the world leaders in the science of prevention for Alzheimer's disease here today. We're very fortunate. Um, and the first um, speaker is going to be Dr. Christine Yaffe. She's a professor of neurology and psychiatry and epidemiology at the University of Southern California at San Francisco. You said, yeah, right, sorry. University of California, San Francisco, and um, conducted one of the first clinical trials of prevention for Alzheimer's and has been at this. Uh, I, I like to think that I have a lot of papers published in the literature with 350. And when I read Christine's bio, she's got over 600. So <laughs> she's really busy. So let me turn it to you, Christine. Sure. Um, thank you, Howard. I'm really happy to be here. I, uh, I've known Howard. Uh, I think we met, actually, at an ADDF physical activity symposium um, in your offices a, a while ago. So it's just amazing to see how much it's developed and how much you've done. And, the, and um, thanks to all of you, really. Um, so, you know, you know Alzheimer's is a huge deal. It, it's, it's a big, big deal. Um, the numbers are increasing. We think that um, the numbers are going to triple in this country. Who has Alzheimer's? Worldwide, triple, maybe quadruple. This is a problem. It's a big deal. Uh, of course, it's, it's a devastating disease, um, you know, huge toll on families, emotionally, financially. Um, so we've got to do something about this. And, you know, we've heard that, that um, you know, the, the, the w well, the other thing, the important is, you know, it affects women more, which maybe we'll talk a little bit about. We, we think interesting reasons. We don't completely understand why. It affects minoritized elders more. Um, we really need to get to the bottom of some of this. And as we've heard, 
you know, the last few, the last couple of decades were kind of disappointing. We just kept saying, if I heard one more time, you know, oh, in the next five or ten years, we'll we'll figure this out, and kept going another five or ten years, another. But uh, you know what? I think we're really here. It's just amazing how much has changed just in the last year or two. The the drugs um, finally are, are coming to fruition. It's very exciting. We've been using the same drugs for twenty years in clinical practice, and now. You know, we, and they were okay, they weren't great, but they were okay. And now we really think we've got some much more effective drugs, so really exciting. Uh, th there's a little controversial, some of them, but, but we're gonna get there. Uh, the biomarkers that, that Howard alluded to are incredible. I mean, imagine we now have a blood test. You can see if somebody has Alzheimer's. It's gonna revolutionize the, the field and, and the clinical practice, really. Um, and, and I'm gonna talk also about prevention. You know, so we, we really have to get at the, 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 this is what we all want. We wanna prevent the disease. We don't wanna you know, treat the disease. So um, I think one of the most exciting things that we've discovered, and I'm happy to say we were, we were the first to, 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 my group was the first to show this, we think that about 40% of Alzheimer's could be prevented. Now, there is a big genetic part of Alzheimer's, right, that's harder to, you can't pick your parents. Uh, it's hard to do. Um, but, but, you know, we do think that there's about 40% that could be prevented, and that's because we know that Alzheimer's has a lot of risk factors, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about them. And if you could modify those risk factors, you know, not even change them completely, but modify them 25, 50%, you could have a big downstream effect on Alzheimer's from a public health point of view, but also hopefully from, from a, 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 an individual point of view. So that's what we're really excited about. Now, you all know it's hard to change behavior. You know, I need to probably eat a little better and exercise a little more, but, but you know, we, we think that we can actually move the needle and have a big effect what are the things we're talking about? Physical activity, cognitive activity, using your brain, um, improving your sleep, very, very interesting uh, uh, risk factor. Um, cardiovascular risk factors, what do I mean by that? High blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, smoking. You know, and, and Dr. Luxing is gonna talk quite a bit about this. This, this adage, what's good for your heart is good for your brain, I think is really, really important. And we're discovering it's not just because of vascular pathways, it's also a direct effect on amyloid and tau, the proteins that accumulate in the brain to cause Alzheimer's. So it's really interesting, and I think we need to get much more uh, down to the mechanisms of this. But these are some of the, the, the most promising things. Also traumatic brain injury. Um, I was actually uh, at a National Academy of Medicine forum. We're looking at traumatic brain injury. It turns out this is a really important risk factor for getting dementia. There's some other things that we talk about, but I don't think the evidence is quite as good, and maybe we'll talk a little bit about how you, how you know whether something really works or not. You know, I don't think it's gonna be blueberries, but you know, we, we need to figure out you know, what, what's the science telling us? What are the mechanisms? What do the studies show? So there's some promising but not less clear, I think, with, um, uh, I'd say, diet, um, social engagement, sensory changes like hearing and vision, and um, depression. I think those are, those are areas that we need more research on but are looking good. I don't think quite as clear as the, as the other ones I mentioned. So, if these things are preventable, and we know they're very common, right? You know, a lot of people have sleep issues, a lot of people have, have hypertension. How can we move the needle? How can you get people to, to, to change their behavior? There was a very important trial called the FINGER trial. Um, gosh, a while ago now, seven years ago or so. And this was a colleague from Finland who ran this study. It was, it was Finnish, it was all white Finnish um, adults who were, they didn't have Alzheimer's, but they, but they were older, they had maybe some risk factors, and they were, half of them got the usual control group, and, and half of them got interventions looking at cardiovascular risk factors, they had diet changes, they had uh, physical activity and cognitive stimulation. And at the end of two years, the group who got the intervention actually did better than the group who had the usual education. So that really tells us you can actually 
if you change these behaviors, you can actually change the slope of, of the cognitive trajectory. And so we're really, really interested in that. And now a number of, of different countries are, are having these kind of trials. The US, interestingly, has been a little behind. Why? I think because we're, we're um, you know, we're much more interested in pharma and, and biotech, and, which are all really great, but we, don't, we haven't invested as much as, as I think we should in some of these risk factor changes and risk reduction and lifestyle changes. But that's changing. So we're now having some of these trials. I think um, Dr. Luxinger will talk a little bit about this. And we just finished a trial that I really want to tell you about. Um, it, it's, I can't even say it's hot off the press because we haven't even published it yet. But, but it's, we're working on it. We're about to publish it. Um, what we did was we took people who had uh, increased risk of, of, of having Alzheimer's based on these risk factors. And we said, OK, we're not going to just tell you what to do. We're going to ask you what you want to do. What do you want to work on? It was personalized. What, what risk factors do you have, and what do you want to work on, and how do you want to work on it? And even though it was COVID, and everything sort of got crazy and remote, and you know, it, was, it was a mess, lo and behold, we finished the trial um, uh, over in the, in the fall, and we found huge benefits with the group that actually worked on the risk factors compared to control. And, the, and these were people with Alzheimer's disease? No, these were people at risk. But it was really primary prevention. They didn't have Alzheimer's. Okay. They were older with risk factors. So we're extremely excited about this. We want to do a bigger trial. We're going to talk, hopefully, more about this. But I'm really excited. And the effects, by the way, were as big as the drug trials, if not bigger. So this is a big deal. No side effects. Cheap. You know, so I'm very, very excited about it. Um, and I think, you know, we're, we're ready now. I just want to end by saying I think not only have we made great discoveries, but I think we're at a place now where we can combine drugs and risk factors. Why is it either or? It should be like cardiovascular disease. You go to the doctor and they say, okay, we want you to lose some weight, try and exercise, change your diet take this drug you know, for cholesterol, take this drug for hypertension, we're going to be in the same boat. I, I would bet in five or 10 years, my, my five or 10 years, we're, we're going to say, here's a drug for inflammation, here's a drug for maybe tau, but, but please work on your sleep and uh, try and exercise more and reduce your hypertension. You know, so we're coming. I think it's really exciting. It's going to really change this terrible disease from prevention and from treatment. And, and just let me, yeah, this is great. Thank you. Um, just let me say that, um, Christine, you know, we can, we can talk about these risk factors, but what we need is data. And I think Christine has been generating the data over the many years to, to really put the science behind prevention so that we can come out here publicly and speak about it with great credibility based on the research that Christine and others have done um, over the last few decades, I guess. Um, and, and one more thing, you, you know, when we talk about these lifestyle interventions, like let's say exercise, um, let me just ask that one question about how strong is the evidence that exercise can prevent Alzheimer's disease? And what have you thought about in terms of the mechanism? Like sure. what is exercise, if it's effective for preventing Alzheimer's disease, what is it telling us about how you go from exercise to reducing the number of plaques and tangles in the brain. Yeah, so I think the question of evidence, you know, how do you know, how do you know if blueberries are good or not? How do you know? It's hard to, it's hard to know. I mean, you know, uh, Andrew Mitchell knows well, you know, you, you have to know, you know, you have to be a savvy reader, right? You can't just read or, or believe everything you read or hear. You have to try and dig a little deeper. and. Um, trust your sources, but also I think what we do is we try and look at, you know, okay, are there good mechanisms? So is there good biology underlying this that suggests that, that this makes sense? Turns out with physical activity, well, obviously it's good for your heart, you know, it's, it's, you know that's good, but it turns out it also has a big role in, in the brain. It, it actually, physical activity causes new neurons and to new neurons to grow and to connect. Wow, that's pretty profound, right? Yeah. It, it causes all kinds of other changes in the brain, uh, probably some changes with amyloid and tau. So you can look at the mechanisms that we, we have to be based in biology. That's our bedrock. 
And then you look at the quality of the studies. The gold standard are always these trials where you take people and you say, you know, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, you know, you're going to be in the control, you're going to get the intervention. That way you get rid of those annoying people who, you know, who only drink one glass of red wine a night, not two, not zero, and the they floss their thing. teeth every they floss their teeth every night. Because we know that the people who do healthy behaviors are different, right? So you want to get rid of that bias by doing these trials. And that's the that's the gold standard. Yeah. So two comments. One, I, I have my story about bread. Oh, yeah. If I may tell. So, so just to illustrate some of the problems with evidence, um, I can prove to you that bread causes felonies. And the way I can do that is that 95% of all felonies are committed within 24 hours of eating bread. <laughs> OK. So, so there's fallacies. There are other jokes I could tell you. But the other thing I want to say, when we presented, we funded one of the first of these clinical trials of exercise for Alzheimer's disease and cognitive aging and showed uh, the, the investigator that we invested in showed that uh, ex a very simple exercise of three times a week going to a, a gym actually um, increased the volume of the brain, particularly in areas where Alzheimer's starts, and actually re um, reduced what's called um, or improved cognitive function over a six-month period. So that was one of the first evidences. When I presented that to my board, one of my board members said, Howard, I'm a couch potato. Can't you develop a pill that <laughs> would mimic the effects of exercise? And I said, we're already doing that because we are investing in a company that's currently out of Stanford University in California that's developing a pill that mimics the effects of exercise. It's on a molecule called BDNF. Mm -hmm which actually, as, as Christine mentioned, increases the number of neurons and is what we call neuroprotective and could be revolutionary. So let me turn now to um, a focus. Jose Luxinger, Dr. Luxinger, is a professor of neurology and like Medicine, medicine and epidemiology. I'm sorry, medicine. Okay. Right, I'm sorry, medicine and epidemiology at Columbia University and has focused his career on diabetes uh, as a risk factor, but will also talk, talk to us about cardiovascular risk factors, and especially metformin, which I know we're all interested in, and, and its role in, in the prevention of Alzheimer's disease. Sure, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I mean, before I, I begin talking about that, I just want to say I'm very grateful, personally, to ADDF. ADDF uh, gave me seed money to start a clinical trial of metformin approximately 16 or 17 years ago. Wow. And. Uh, <laughs> Time and I, you know, I don't, I don't have the budget in front of me, but it was probably between two hundred thousand and three hundred thousand dollars, and that has led directly to over forty million dollars in in funding to continue the program, and indirectly, actually, over a hundred million dollars. So, you Ooh. know, I think I'm a testament to the power of the investments that ADDF do, and so I. Appreciate you being here and Thank you. and uh, supporting uh, ADDF. So okay. I I will anchor my my conversation in the following way. Uh, uh, we're in a very exciting time because we have proof finally that Alzheimer's disease can be treated with these monoclonal antibodies. But I think that there is proof as well that Alzheimer's disease and cognitive disorders in general can be prevented. And the one of the, I think one, one of the most important observations that have been, has been made in studies in the last few years is that it's been observed that the risk of Alzheimer's disease and dementia at the population level has actually been decreasing. Although the numbers have been increasing simply because the population is larger and the older population is larger. But actually, the risk has been decreasing. And when the first study that came out reported this, there was a little bit of skepticism. But then there's been several studies that have shown that over the last 40 or 50 years, all across the world, the risk of Alzheimer's has decreased. Now, how, how can this be? And I think that the, the, what's been happening in parallel with that phenomenon is that in the last 40 or 50 years, the treatment of heart disease has improved. The treatment and prevention of stroke has improved. The treatment of you know, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, treatment and prevention of diabetes has improved. And you know, as Christine said, what's good for the heart is good for the brain. 
And particularly, there's been a dramatic decrease in strokes, you know, when, when there's death of brain cells, basically, which clearly makes, uh, you know, Alzheimer's, uh, you know, more likely to happen. So, uh, you know, to me, that is proof, uh, not 100%, but 80%, at least I believe it, I, I'm convinced, that uh, Alzheimer's is not only treatable, but it's preventable as well. So, uh, you know, when I was a resident uh, 30 years ago, uh, there were no statins. You know, there wasn't, you know, uh, things like uh, Lipitor and things of this sort. I'm sorry if I'm mentioning a, uh, a commercial name. It just started at that time. Uh, there were very few treatments for, um, for diabetes. And, uh, and then the treatment of heart disease was just being revolutionized at that time with you know, catheterization and doing you know, procedures in the heart and, and such without the need to, uh, to, to do uh, outright uh, surgery. And since then, there's been a huge uh, improvement in the number of drugs, uh, but also preventive strategies for things like high blood pressure, diabetes, and cholesterol. So I'm gonna go a little bit one by one those things, because I think it's important. Uh, I'll try to do it in an efficient way, because we, we have time constraints. But anyhow, high blood pressure uh, is without a doubt the, um, you know, I think the greatest risk factor for stroke. Uh, there's others like high cholesterol and diabetes as well, but uh, without a doubt, uh, um, high blood pressure is, is the greatest one. And when I was a resident, uh, you know, uh, 30 years ago, we used to, you know, we used to tolerate things like systolic blood pressure of 160. You know, I think we all kind of know our numbers with blood pressure. That's the high number. And since then, we've learned that, uh, no, you actually have to go lower, you know, that, uh, you know, first it was at 140 now, we're talking about levels of 130, 120 being better. And so now with uh, hitting those targets and also with improved availability of medications for high blood pressure, we've seen a dramatic decrease in stroke, which we believe that it's improved, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the risk of cognitive impairment in general. And I, I think, Christine, I think we collaborated in a report from the National Academies actually that sort of reported uh, the, the likely benefits of uh, blood pressure reduction. So the, the other one is cholesterol. You know, we, uh, um, you know, again, 30 years ago, uh, when I was a resident, uh, the first clinical trial proving that a medication for cholesterol was beneficial for heart, heart disease, uh, simvastatin at that time, it was a trial called the FOREST trial, uh, uh, came out before that, you know, it was very rare to have anybody on these cholesterol-lowering uh, medications. Uh, and since then, uh, a very large proportion of the population is on these medications, particularly if they're at high risk. If they have diabetes or if they have high blood pressure, they're on these medications, and some of you uh, may be on these medications as well. And this has resulted also in a dramatic decrease in heart disease and in and, uh, and, and stroke as well. And then I've been particularly interested in diabetes uh, throughout my career, uh, as uh, Howard uh, mentioned. Diabetes doesn't occur alone. You know, diabetes, as probably you know, is a, an elevation of blood sugar that is abnormal. By the way, I'm talking about type 2 diabetes, not type 1 diabetes, which is uh, a different type of disease. Uh, but type 2 diabetes is also accompanied by high blood pressure and by high cholesterol and by high inflammation, which is called the metabolic syndrome. And I think Christine was, uh, I think, the first person to report on the importance of the metabolic syndrome and inflammation for, for cognition. I think you published that in JAMA a bunch of years ago. Uh, but uh, so anyhow, all these things uh, happen together. So I, I was very interested in the potential relationship between diabetes and Alzheimer's disease. I'm an, I'm an internist, I'm a primary care physician, I'm an internist like Howard, so I, I treat uh, diabetes in my clinical practice. And you know, so I wanted to know whether diabetes was causing uh, what we were calling dementia or Alzheimer's disease at the time, 
through amyloid and the mechanisms involved in Alzheimer's disease or through other uh, mechanisms. And so a lot of my research has been in trying to establish uh, whether the high risk of cognitive disorders and dementia and diabetes is due to amyloid or not, because now that we have treatments for, for the amyloid, we need to know if that particular risk group needs that treatment or a, a completely different uh, type of treatment. So around diabetes, the other important observation that was made was that many of the mechanisms or phenomena that occur in diabetes are important in Alzheimer's disease. So for example, diabetes is, is associated with a high inflammation in general, a high inflammatory state in the body, and that's very important in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we believe in the, in the brain, but also under the neck, if you will. Uh, also, oxidative stress, uh, which is what we try to take vitamins for, vitamin C and vitamin E, although that's controversial, or blueberries <laughs> and strawberries, like, like uh, uh, Christine was saying. That's also, uh, it's important in Alzheimer's disease, uh, and it's observed in the brain of people with Alzheimer's disease, but, uh, and it's also uh, very high in people with diabetes, actually, and with a metabolic syndrome, and people with pre-diabetes as well. So, um, uh, so there's medications that are very good at targeting this. You know, so there are some medications in diabetes that what they do is they simply make you pump more insulin, you know, in the pancreas to bring the glucose down. Okay, but there's other medications that don't make you pump more insulin. They actually make you more insulin sensitive make make the the uh, insulin work better, if you will, and uh, and then they uh, um, also reduce inflammation, reduce oxidative stress, uh, improve cholesterol, actually can improve high blood pressure as well. And so there's several medications uh, that can do that, and I focus particularly on metformin. Uh, because it was a, a very, it's a very cheap medication. It costs, you know, cents per pill. Uh, it's been out of patent for a while, so it's, it's, it's what's called an orphan medication, if you will. So one of the few ways to study these medications is with support with Alzheimer's Disease Drug Discovery Foundation, in addition to the National Institute on, on Aging and, and, and NIH. Uh, and so uh, I, I, I was used to using metformin. I was not afraid of using it because it doesn't, it doesn't cause bottoming of, of your blood glucose even if you don't have diabetes. So it's very safe to use. The side effects are usually gastrointestinal, meaning that people can get bloating, gassy, get, can get diarrhea at worst, and if that happens, then you know maybe they cannot take the medication. So. So, and, and, and again, metformin has all these benefits. It, it decreases inflammation, it decreases oxidative, oxidative stress, it can, improve, it can improve high blood pressure, not on its own, but it helps. It can improve uh, cholesterol. And so I said, let me give it a try and see if this helps for uh, the prevention of Alzheimer's disease in, in people at risk. And so. Uh, you know, we did a, a small pilot clinical trial supported by the Alzheimer's Disease Drug Discovery Foundation and the um, uh, National Institute on Aging, and that clinical trial gave a signal. It was a small clinical trial in 80 people. Uh, it, it showed some, some uh, evidence of promise because people, their memory were better after 12 months. So on the basis of that, we applied for a, for a larger clinical trial of uh, metformin, which is currently underway. Uh, COVID has not been helpful <laughs> for the completion of the trial, but things are now back to normal, and I'm confident that we're going to be able to finish it in the next few years. And, and then uh, we're also collaborating with Mia Kivipelto, uh, investigators in Sweden and Finland and the UK, to do uh, a trial of the intervention that, that uh, uh, Christine um, uh, mentioned 
uh, in addition to metformin, and I believe ADDF is, is, is yeah. uh, supporting uh, that as well. So anyhow, that's the gist of what So let of me ask you a question. Is. Sure. You're a, you are a practicing doctor like I am, um, and maybe many people in the audience don't have diabetes, but they've heard about metformin, and we know metformin from the biology of aging is like the leading anti-aging drug, yeah. and aging is the leading risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And I know you have a practice too, Christine. Let me ask you, in the context of a drug like metformin, um, would, how do you prescribe it off-label? Like if somebody doesn't have diabetes, but they want to ask the question, should I take metformin today to prevent Alzheimer's disease? Would you prescribe it? And if you would, like, under what conditions would you do that? Uh, how would you monitor Yeah, that's it? a great question. I would be cautious because, you know, we, we've been burned before in getting ahead of ourselves and thinking that something helps and then it doesn't. But I think if, if there's evidence of the metabolic syndrome, okay, if there's evidence of what we call insulin resistance, uh, if, if there is what we call pre-diabetes, which is not necessarily, you know, an elevation of, that, of, of glucose where you would give, uh, you know, diabetes medications, uh, then I, I would say that there's, there's likely to be a benefit for the metformin, uh, not uh, e even if there's none for, the, for, for cognition, but there's likely to be uh, a benefit in producing a little bit of weight loss, if you want to get a little bit of weight loss, if to improve the cholesterol, to get the glucose levels from the pre-diabetes level to being a little lower. And the worst thing that can happen is that if, if you cannot tolerate the metformin, then you stop it. So but I, I, so I, I would have a conversation with with a person who's considering this, who does not have diabetes, and uh, first, I think, identify, do they have risk factors that would benefit for, from metformin? Because I think it, then it becomes, I don't want to say a no-brainer, but, but then there's, there's a likely benef uh, uh, there's likelihood of benefit, uh, um, and, and then just, just see how it goes. I mean, I think one of the most powerful things that one can do uh, when, when one is treated with this medication says, see what happens to your glucose, see what happens to your cholesterol, uh, mm -hmm. see what happens to your blood pressure. Because if you see that it improves, then you know something beneficial biomarkers. must be happening. Yes. Actually biomarkers, yeah. Correct. Christine, you mentioned sleep. Um, why is sleep important? I mean, it's hard to go from like um, understanding, okay, sleep, we found sleep is a risk factor, or ab ab sleep problems or risk factors. But what happens during sleep that, you know, makes it a risk factor? Good question. So, you know, up until recently, no, we didn't know why do we spend a third of our life in sleep? Like, you know, must be doing something good, right? It, I mean, it, evolutionarily, what, what did it do that, that made it something we do so much of? And it turns out it's really interesting. I, I think some of the most, you know, interesting science has come out about the brain in the last 10 years have been around sleep. So it turns out when we sleep, the brain gets quiet and it allows the, the, the spaces in the brain to flow out some of the toxic proteins that have accumulated in the day, like amyloid and tau, our two friends that, that seem to be very involved in Alzheimer's. So what happens is if you sleep, you know, it's like a clearinghouse. The, 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 the toxins get removed. If you don't sleep very well, or if you're, you know, you have sleep apnea and you're, you know, up and down without even knowing it, or you have, you have um, low oxygen that happens sometimes in sleep apnea, that disrupts the clearing mechanism. And so it looks like you get more buildup. You get more buildup of the amyloid and tau. And sure enough, this has been shown in, in rodent models and in flies. And now in people using these biomarkers, if you, if you take people and, and, and you don't let them sleep, you see greater tau and amyloid. So it's really interesting. And so we're, we're very interested in, in if you can improve sleep, can you prevent Alzheimer's and other dementia? And um, there haven't been a lot of trials, but it's a really great area now. Yep. Okay, I want to open it up to the audience for questions. We have a lot of questions here, please. Could you comment on the use of sleep aids as a factor with Alzheimer's? 
Sure, I, <laughs> I, I get this question a lot, and, and the, 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 I think we don't really know. So what I tell people is in the short term, a sleep aid's probably helpful. You know, if, if you really have not been sleeping well and you, you need to get a good night's sleep for something or, you know, you're flying internationally, I use a sleep aid when I fly internationally because I, I you know, I want to get sleep. Um, but so I think short term it's probably okay. Uh, there are two caveats to that. One, long term we think it's probably not helpful. You don't want to be on a sleep aid indefinitely because it probably uh, causes some other issues. Um, but the second caveat is there's some classes of, of sleep drugs that are, are more benign than others. So some of the sleep drugs, even some of the over-the-counters, you know, you, you, you pick up something and it says PM or a lot of it has um, some pretty heavy drugs that can affect your cognition. So you be careful that you don't, you know, you know, think you're helping your cognition when you might even be harming it with these other drugs. So be careful with what they are and, and maybe talk to your doctor. Um, but again, short term, probably okay. Long term, I would avoid. Yeah. Uh, speaking of sleep aids, could you talk about Belsama? Yeah, I, I don't know much about it, really. Do you? Do either no, of you? No, I don't have any real clinical experience. I guess there was a report that it might be protective or something, but yeah. there's also reports that Ambien is bad for you and these benzodiazepams are bad for you, but these are just associations and we don't have a clinical trial, so to speak, of, of yeah. these drugs. So. Um, I agree with what you said, but I, I don't think there's a lot of clinical experience in terms of Belsamra and the risk of Alzheimer's disease or cognitive impairment, but I know you can have side effects from that drug just like you can from the other sleep aids. Yes? Yeah. While we're still talking about sleep, how about naps? <laughs> That's the other question I get all the time. So, so this is fantastic. So um, great question. Right? Should you do a power nap? You know, where you you know go climb under your desk and sleep for 15 minutes? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. So so we did this study actually a few years ago. A colleague of mine and I looked at the and, and we, we showed that um, that napping in this was in older people. They didn't have Alzheimer's. They older normal people. And we looked and we found that using um, objective measures, you know, measuring the sleep with these uh, actigraphs. We found that actually people who napped had higher risk of, of cognitive decline and dementia. So we were, we thought, oh, but wait, but wait, 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 wait. So then, so then we said this, let's look at the group, let's divide them into two groups. Who are the ones who actually had a good night's sleep the last few nights? Because we had that data, right, from the, from the actor versus who wasn't sleeping well. And what we found was really interesting. If you're not sleeping well, the naps were, were helpful. So, you know, they're, you're, they're catching you up. But if you're sleeping well, napping was not a good thing. Meaning you're, you know, you're probably, maybe it's, you're sick from something else, or maybe it's a medicine, or, so it was really interesting. So the answer is, you know, kind of both, but, but I think it depends. It depends, <laughs> right. But I think if you're, sleep, if you're not sleeping well, a nap's a good thing. Yes. Hi. Um, many people take anti-inflammatory drugs, whether for an autoimmune disease, uh, colitis, or rheumatoid arthritis. Have you looked into what effect the um, anti-inflammatory uh, biologics might have on future Alzheimer's? Yeah, I'll, t I'll take that one. Years ago, there, were, there was a lot of epidemiological data that people that took non-steroidals had a 40% or a 50% reduced risk of Alzheimer's, Mo Motrin, the typical drugs. Um, and then there were clinical trials of Vioxx and Celebrex and other ibuprofen for Alzheimer's disease, and they didn't work. Now, that was in an era when I think we, didn't, we definitely didn't have the biomarkers to find out which Alzheimer patients were inflamed in their brain and which weren't. Um, one of the things we're trying to do now is develop the biomarkers to identify people that not only have amyloid and plaques, but have inflammation in their brain around the plaques because it's been shown that people that just have amyloid without inflammation don't progress or they progress very slowly whereas people that have inflammation in their brain uh, progress much more rapidly. So the idea now is how do we reduce this inflammation? We funded a clinical trial at the University of Southampton in the UK several years ago of a drug, the most common drug used for these inflammatory uh, diseases, Enbrel. Mm. And um, actually there was um, 
preliminary results already that Enbrel would slow it down completely if, you, if patients got Enbrel. This was um, Clive Holmes at the University of Southampton. And we funded another study of that, and we're also funding other studies to directly affect what's neuroinflammation. We want to directly reduce the amount of neuroinflammation. So there's a lot of interest in it. We're trying to develop biomarkers like YKL40 as one blood test and spinal fluid test to identify these people that have inflammation with Alzheimer's so we can target them and enrich those patients in clinical trials and develop novel drugs. I mean, one other company that we're supporting out of the clinical uh, Cleveland Clinic is called Neurotherapia, and they have what's called a CB2 receptor agonist, which is a small molecule pill that uh, binds to the cannabinoid receptor in the brain, which is actually inflammatory. So it reduces the amount of infl inflammation in the brain. And they're going into phase two now. They've shown that the drug is safe. Uh, there's been a lot of animal model data. So I will say that, that years ago, inflammation was totally underfunded, and nobody really believed that inflammation was important in this disease. And I think that's changed almost 180 degrees now. I think we, there's a lot of interest in, in developing inflammation. Um, Elector and Denali are another two biotech companies that have inflammation drugs in development uh, against a g gene risk factor called TREM2. So that's a short answer. <laughs> Well, that would come out of a large scale, like kind of what we call real world data um, to see, you know, if people with rheumatoid arthritis who get, actually I was involved in a study like that and, and people with rheumatoid arthritis were at greater risk for getting Alzheimer's disease. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there, there was data. Um, there, is, there is ways of looking at that. But I think, again, we need the randomized controlled trials ultimately. As I said uh, before, the, the data originally showed that use of non-steroidals reduced the risk by 40, 50%, but then when they ran through trials, it didn't work at all. Yeah. I have two questions. Um, the first is, at what age can you get a brain scan um, for Alzheimer's? And the second is, in terms of physical activity, are there certain types of activity that are better than others? Yeah, let me ask you the first one, and maybe yeah. one or two. So um, anybody can get the brain scan, but I think what, what the point you're raising is really interesting. With the advent of the brain scan for people with Alzheimer's, we could actually see the Alzheimer's disease in the brain for the first time. And then scientists like Risa Sperling and others at Harvard and elsewhere started uh, screening people in the community who were in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. And it turns out that Alzheimer's is a disease of middle age, not just of old age and that people in their 20 years before they develop symptoms, they start developing the disease. They, we start seeing the plaques on the amyloid scans. And what that led to is prevention trials. So these anti-amyloid monoclonal antibodies have been used in early Alzheimer's disease, but there are also studies of prevention where we're finding these people that have very minimal amyloid they're in their 40s and 50s, um, or they have very minimal cognitive symptoms with the amyloid in their brain, and giving them the monoclonal antibodies to see if we, by preventing the uh, occurrence of amyloid in people that are not symptomatic as a secondary prevention study if we could prevent or delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease in late life 20, 15, 20 years later. Um, and it has been modeled that if we could delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease by just five years, we would reduce the number of people that get symptoms from it by 50 percent. So I do think this is an achievable goal today, very much in line with what we're, what we're hearing about prevention, what we're learning about it, and combining drugs along with lifestyle and comorbidity management. And I, I forgot the second question. Physical activity. Okay. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, I don't think that, um, we don't know for sure. It looks like it's probably cardiovascular disease, uh, cardiovascular, you know, aerobic exercise. But um, uh, I'm not sure we know for sure. Some studies have shown that actually weightlifting and stretching could be beneficial, but it's, it's controversial. I think you're, the, the safe answer is aerobic. Would you agree? That, that's what yeah. the evidence yeah. shows, yeah. yes. Yeah. I, I think the other interesting thing is whether you have to continue doing yeah. the exercise to get the benefit, and I think yeah. it looks like that's the yeah. case. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Yes. You mentioned that traumatic brain injuries can contribute to Alzheimer's. Um, I worked for nonprofit for eight years at the height of the um, Iraq-Afghanistan war and met many injured service members with TBIs. Uh, I wonder if there have been any studies in conjunction with the military to uh, work on this and, you know, help these injured service members. 
Um, yes, there have been quite a few studies, some of which are ongoing. Um, we've done quite a bit of work uh, you, with uh, veterans and, and veterans' health data showing that um, veterans are at a, a greater risk of developing dementia who have TBI. So we've done a lot of work in that space, and there's a big, big study now underway looking at uh, uh, veterans or active duty who have a blast injury. You know, so unfortunately, in, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, there were a lot of blast injuries, and so people had a lot of head injuries, um, and now they're being carefully followed, looking at biomarkers, looking at imaging. So I think we'll know that answer in a, a, a few years. They're young people, by and large. They're in their 30s and 40s, so it may be a little early, but, but those studies are underway. A couple of things just to wrap up. Number one, we can detect 20 years in advance. Number two, we can prevent and decrease the incidence by 40%. And note to self, I think I need a nap. <laughs> <laughs> Having said all that, a couple of things. We're going to break now, but our speakers are here. If you want to ask some one-on-one -on -one questions, they're happy to do that. And then outside of this room is the aforementioned Saks Fifth Avenue Acris pop-up store, uh, as well as the Aaron Scent Bar. So enjoy. We'll see you at I'm lunch. I'm going to try the scent bar.